All right, there's still a few people joining the webinar, but I think it's time to get started. Uh, welcome everyone. I, um, my name is John Slocum. I'm the Executive Director of Refugee Council USA, and I'm very pleased to welcome you uh, to this press briefing on Rebuilding Welcome, the State of the U.S. Refugee Program. Uh, just to note at the outset that uh, Refugee Council USA is an umbrella coalition of the nine national refugee resettlement agencies and 20 other nonprofit organizations working nationally and internationally um, to advocate for and provide services to refugees, asylum seekers, asylees, stateless persons, and other forcibly displaced populations. And we're very pleased to have you uh, join us today. Uh, and thanks for taking the time uh, for this uh, for this panel, we've got some great speakers. I'm gonna give a few words of introduction, introduce our speakers, and then we'll get into the presentations. This press briefing is being held in conjunction with RCUSA's Advocacy Days event. Actually, it's an advocacy week. Um, and this uh, pre-COVID would have been a time for us to bring constituents to congressional offices uh, to talk about refugee protection. Um, and uh, thanks to the innovations uh, that are now widespread uh, due to COVID, uh, this is a virtual event. We have over 500 registrants uh, who are primarily constituents uh, from uh, congressional districts who uh, drop in virtually with members of Congress and or their staff, um, representing over 40 states, I think, uh, some nine uh, congressional, I'm sorry, 90 congressional districts are, are participating. And those are bringing the voices of constituents to Washington. These are faith groups, community leaders, employers, um, those who work in refugee resettlement and provide welcome to newcomers. And uh, most importantly, refugees themselves. Um, we have over 70 uh, refugees, former refugees, asylees uh, that are participating in this advocacy week. Um, and they are, are much better equipped to carry the message of, of how much uh, refugee resettlement and uh, the larger system of welcome uh, means uh, to them and really to this country. Uh, they, they give back so much uh, to their communities and enrich our country in so many ways. Um, we've got a great set of speakers today and I wanna introduce them one by one. Um, we have Dauda Sase, who is vice chair of the Refugee Congress Board of Directors. He's also a founding member and president of the Louisiana Organization for Refugees and Immigrants and a former refugee from Sierra Leone living in Louisiana. Next is Mark Hetfield, president and CEO of HIAS, one of the nine national resettlement agencies. We're also joined by former U.S. representative from Florida, Ileana ross Leitonen. Also, Fareshta Ganjavi, who is the founder and executive director of Elena's Light and a former refugee from Afghanistan. And rounding out the list is Rachel Parrish, who is the executive director of Welcoming America. So thank you to you all, a great lineup today. Just a quick note of housekeeping. We're going to hear from our speakers one by one in the order I've uh, just laid out, and then there'll be time for questions from folks on the line. Please plan to introduce yourself and your outlet when asking your question. And my understanding is that uh, those questions would have to be typed into the uh, Q&A function, um, as I don't think anyone except the panelists has access to the microphone uh, for this session. So uh, please keep that in mind, and, and you can begin typing in questions as soon as you like. Um, I'll, uh, I'll call on those questions, and we have some folks that are providing technical support that can uh, bring my attention to any question I may have missed. Just a final note, uh, this briefing is being recorded and is on the record. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, Dauda Sase. Dauda. Good morning, hi everyone. And I wanna thank the ICUSA um, for hosting this um, discussions and where our voices are centered in front of center refugee issues. And as um, John introduced me, um, Name is Daoud Asise, originally from Sierra Leone, and I'm the Vice Chair for Refugee Congress Board of Directors. Refugee Congress is a national organization that have delegates in all 50 states, 
And currently, our member comprises from over 30 countries that are currently represented. Um, our vision is so simple. We want to make sure that wherever conversation is taking place, we want to make sure that the refugee voices is at the front and center of the table. Um, why we do what we do? Why we want to make sure that refugee voice are front and center at the table? We all saw in the news what is currently happening in Ukraine. We saw firsthand within the last two months, we are seeing that day in, day out, we're seeing families separated. When I saw an image that was a month ago with, um, with um, dead bodies with their hands and fingers chopped off, it took me back within my experience in my home country when my hand was almost chopped off. He brought back that image of me at a 16 years old, losing my dad and watch my dad got shot in front of me. It brought that image of my family house set on fire with my relatives, including my mom and my seven years old sister. We are in that house when it was set on fire. He brought back this image. And unfortunately, I lost my seven years old sister in that fire. He brought that image of me when I get shot and left to die. This is showing that in as much as how terrible in Ukraine, within a month, we've seen over millions of refugees have already been created. Yes, but the, but the trauma and the casualty is this the same across the globe. What I experience is not different from what they are experiencing right now. Now the problem is, is how society reacts, is how our leaders respond to those situations. And I'm seeing the response now that is happening, which is uh, it's not equal to what, to, uh, it was, it was, it's not equal towards the global refugee crisis that we are witnessing. I remember four years ago when I started uh, my community organizing, I was talking about, we were talking about 25 million refugee displaced, displaced people, but now it is going close to 100 million, if not more. Within four years, the numbers has quadrupled. So um, this bring all of us together to make sure that it is our responsibility it takes all of us to see what we can do to help those vulnerable communities. How we can have an equitable pathway to people seeking protections and refugees that are languishing. We don't know how the distribution is happening, but we know that the administration, they are capable, capable of handling that. Because if they announced that was a week ago or two, the Unite for Ukrainians, which we applaud the efforts of the administration in doing that. If they can, if that can be done in a fast space, in a fast space, pace, I believe the refugees, the Afghans refugees that are suffering, the refugees from Cameroons um, that are languishing in Nigeria, the other refugees of a global refugee crisis that we're seeing in our southern border, people seeking protections. I believe the administration will take time to address that. So please, um, when I got my interview, let me close with this. When I got my last interview while I was at the refugee camp, over 10 years, I went through over countless interviews. I told my wife, when we are approved to come, I say, thank God, 
this is the last time we will tell our story. I have to relieve this trauma in saying it. Little did I know that coming to the US and engaging this community organizing, I will be telling my story and retelling it and retelling it. It's not fun. It's not something that I take joy in doing. But I'm doing that as a way of giving back, as a way of amplifying the voices of the many refugees that are languishing in a refugee camp. I'm bearing this pain to heal in order to help others because even one person, one person going through this pain that we are going, one is too many. How much more now? We're talking about millions. So thank you all, John, and I'll pass it back on to you for your attention. Thank you, Dauda. There's little I can add to the eloquence that uh, that you've uh, you've brought to us today. So I just I, I thank you, um, and I will turn things over next to Mark Hetfield. Thank you, thank you, John. And I can't add anything either to what Dauda said. Dauda made a really compelling case as to why it's incumbent upon us as humanitarians to welcome refugees, but. As Americans, we also know that it, ha it happens to be in our national interest to do so as well. And the, the uh, drafters of the Refugee Act of 1980, which it's hard to believe, passed the Senate unanimously and passed the House with overwhelming bipartisan support. They knew this. And so they allowed the United States not only to bring over refugees into our country, um, but also a pathway for them to have access to a green card and then citizenship so they truly can have that peace of mind and contribute to our society. The tragedy is that at a time of global refugee crisis, the greatest in human history, the previous administration eviscerated America's capacity to do that by slashing the refugee program. And I'm disappointed to say that the current administration has not done nearly enough to build that back up and to demonstrate both American leadership and to take full advantage of everything that refugees bring to our country. And rather than building up the refugee admissions program, they have actually created inferior parallel processes to bring people here. The 80,000 Afghans who came here are here in limbo under parole. They have no access to a green card or, or to citizenship. So we're waiting for Congress to act to give them that access. Uh, the Ukrainians who are coming here are being brought in again under parole, um, not through the refugee program. They too do not have the freedom to choose whether or not they remain here and, and apply for a green card. It's really time to focus on rebuilding the refugee program, but at the current rate, we will only admit about 18,000 refugees this year in a program that in 1980 welcomed over 200,000 to this country. We can do a lot better to demonstrate American leadership. We need to focus on rebuilding this great program and welcoming more new Americans to this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I'll turn the floor over next to former Representative Eliana ross -Lateman. Well, thank you so much, uh, John, Dowda, and, and Mark. Uh, as we've heard, the United States has a long and proud tradition of welcoming refugees. In fact, that tradition is part of my own family story. I was born in Cuba, came to the United States when I was only eight years old with my parents and my brother fleeing persecution. Many families like mine are in similar circumstances today as we speak. From Venezuela, from the Northern Triangle in our own hemisphere, to Myanmar, Afghanistan, elsewhere around the world. Resettlement here in the United States gives them a second chance, but it gives us a chance too. People who come here seeking safety are our future leaders, our future Congresswomen, and our future doctors and teachers, nurses and neighbors. They are the foundation of our democracy. Just like my family proudly did in South Florida, Refugees help grow local economies. They help create jobs. 
According to the American Immigration Council in my home state of Florida, refugees contributed nearly $750 million in taxes. We generated nearly $180 million in business income in 2019 alone. Refugees come here with immense skills. We see it in stories all over the United States, community by community, that our country is stronger when we are welcoming. We also see what we lose when we turn our backs on people seeking protection. Recent research from the Center for Global Development showed that refugee restrictions under the previous administration permanently reduced the U.S. economy by $9.1 billion a year. And Mark talked about those cuts. They calculated that the economy gains a net GDP impact of more than $30,000 per refugee per year. Gains. It's a positive. And unfortunately, that loss will only grow each year when we limit, when we limit the number of refugees we welcome into our communities. A robust U.S. refugee resettlement program also advances U.S. foreign policy leadership goals. It helps us to improve our relationship with other countries. At a time when global crises feel more pervasive, they feel more urgent than ever, and a staggering 84 million people have been driven from their homes by conflict, by persecution, the time is obviously now to show the world that America is ready to do our part. And as Mark said, we're nowhere near close to our goal of welcoming 125,000 refugees this year. And we're halfway through the fiscal year already. So we need to reform. We need to invest in our resettlement system so that it can work for the many families like mine who need it ahora, now. To those many, many families like mine who are waiting for your moment to be welcomed here, please know that we want you to come. We know how much you will do for our communities, for our economy, and indeed for the world. And I'm so honored to be here joining Dauda and Farishte. As fellow, as fellow refugees, we have important stories to tell. Dauda's was heartbreaking about why we make our country great. And I'm grateful for RCUSA, Refugee Congress USA, for giving us all the opportunity to speak together about this critical issue today. Muchísimas gracias, amigos. I'm greatly honored to be here. Thank you, John. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And we really appreciate uh, those figures that you provided on, on the, the economic contributions of refugees. I mean, we know in terms of moral commitments, when you say one person you save, save the world. But the numbers of people that we have provided that kind of protection and security to um, have enriched our country, you know, literally in an economic sense, uh, beyond the, the humanitarian and ethical uh, and, and cultural benefits that we've, um, that we've derived. So uh, thank you so much for your, for your intervention today. I'll turn next to uh, Faresh Ganjabi, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. I apologize right now. I'm invited in a lunch in New York City, and uh, I'm here for the uh, Women of Survive of the War event. Uh, apologize for the back noise and uh, changing the lights, everything. It's unwanted. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for giving us opportunity to talk. And as everyone said, my name is Farashah Ganjabi. I'm founder and the director of um, Eleanor's Light. Eleanor's Light is a non-profit organization in Connecticut. Um, we aiming to help and support um, refugee and immigrant women and children to build a brighter future for their life here in the United States. Myself, as a former Afghan refugee, in 2011, when I came to United States and to Connecticut, I was welcomed with a resettlement agency named IRES, Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services. I was very um, lucky and happy to have such a this community to supporting me at each step in my life. When I graduate, 
I had my caseworker, Miss Linda Bronstein, with me on graduation. When I went, um, when I invited to NBC News to talk about um, the meal plan we had for the the meal plan we had, uh, I had my coworker with me. When I graduated, I got a job, my first job in the United States as a healthcare coordinator at IRIS, and I had opportunity to welcome others, such as myself. And my coworker became my best friend and started supporting me and recently became a board of director at Eleanor's Light. I see they help us to apply and bring in my husband to United States after two years of research in, in this country. As a, someone who benefits and also try to help to other refugees who are coming new to United States, I'm asking and recording to support oh, discernment wow. agencies and other agencies and communities such as Eleanor's Light to support and giving help to the newcomers. Uh, it's my pleasure to be at the talk with you and uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Freshta. Really appreciate your participation here and, and the fact that after having come to this country, you are turning around and, and helping others uh, as well. So it's a, it's a real reinforcement of, of the message that I think all of us have, have been uh, putting out today. I'll turn next uh, to our last speaker, uh, Rachel Parrish. Go ahead, Rachel. Thank you, John. And it really is an honor to follow so many uh, just extraordinary leaders who, who really are paying it forward and, and bringing so much to uh, the fabric of this country. Uh, my organization is uh, called Welcoming America, and we have the great privilege to work with communities in 47 states and across eight countries. Uh, and it's through that work uh, that I can share that there are places in every corner of this country and globe that want to be welcoming to displaced people and who are all the better for it. Uh, and I can tell you that they are displaying the kind of moral leadership that Dauda talked about, the kind of moral leadership that we're counting on our federal leaders to rise to meet in this moment. In the United States, uh, there are places like Boise, Idaho, San Antonio, Texas, Erie, Pennsylvania, small towns across the heartland, where there's a desire to do more, to raise the bar higher, to deepen efforts that are already happening, to build welcoming infrastructure so that people who arrive as refugees and their longtime neighbors can together put down roots, thrive, belong in the places we call home, no matter where we've come from. The local response to arrivals from Afghanistan is really a testament to this, and just one example of what communities have been doing and investing in for decades when it comes to facilitating a welcoming, inclusive home for the displaced. Millions of Americans have been part of these efforts through our schools, our community centers, our places of worship and of employment, our libraries, our chambers of commerce, and our cultural organizations and civic organizations. Millions of us want to see us being welcoming, engaging with the world, tapping into the talent and contributions of more Americans, finding ways to stabilize families by ensuring they stay together, and building the capacity to make sure that when new people arrive, we not only have enthusiastic neighbors, but a system that prepares American communities for success. And that system is called the U.S. Resettlement Program. It's a network of public-private partnerships and it's abundant refugee leaders. That system helped my own family find our footing in this country. And it's designed for an orderly, responsive, fair, and strong response that meets this growing scale of migration and displacement around the globe that you've heard about in this conversation. The US resettlement system is designed to enable us to play fair rather than playing favorites. It's designed to ensure that we don't let the burden fall entirely to refugees to navigate new systems that too often exclude them and other Americans on the basis of race, origin, and language. It's designed to make sure those systems are more inclusive so that in a country that respects civil rights, we don't create more separate but unequal. I'm joining today to urge this administration and members of Congress to invest in a system that, though gutted by the last administration, is successful, ready to reboot, and supported by millions of Americans who have benefited from its success. Just to cite one more example about the economic benefits, 
2015, Central Ohio calculated that it had gained more than $1.6 billion in contributions to its local economy from refugees and the resettlement program. As we have heard, too many people, our relatives, our loved ones, have waited, have followed the rules, are eligible, but are languishing because we're using our capacity as an excuse to fall short of our resettlement goals and in ways that frankly appear deeply discriminatory. It's our capacity, not our values, that should be malleable. Let's raise the refugee ceiling and with it, let's raise the bar on what we invest in to capitalize on the ways that the resettlement program already helps communities flourish. The federal government is in a position now to not only set the standard for American leadership on welcoming those fleeing persecution, but to make sure that our system is designed and set up for success when people arrive. That includes, as Mark said, ensuring that those arriving have durable forms of status so that we're not reinforcing second-class citizenship. It means working through and investing in US RAP as opposed to working around it and ensuring that the efforts really do reinforce a more equitable system. It means the federal government investing in what has already been built, what is already being invested in in communities, a strong and ready welcoming infrastructure that together with refugee Americans and non-refugee Americans alike is asking for our federal government to step up and step up its commitment to this program. And along with it, the values of fairness, opportunity and, and equality that are really the bedrock of our democracy. Thanks and back over to you, John. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, as Rachel has pointed out, this country is, is filled with, with generous people, um, people willing to open their, their homes and, and in many cases, and certainly their hearts and uh, provide the resources that are needed. Um, and we welcome the, the widest possible participation of the American public and institutions in our society in this welcoming task. Uh, Mark mentioned the Afghans and Ukrainians who came in on humanitarian parole. And um, it's true that that status is not going to be in all cases adequate to the task. The Afghans in particular uh, will unlikely be wanting to return uh, to their home country. They need a more permanent status. Many of the Ukrainians, unfortunately, will probably also be unable to return. So while this task of welcoming, which is, is society-wide, is, is, is of crucial importance. So are the channels that provide the kind of permanent status and rights that our panelists have referenced. We need to rebuild, we need to reform in many respects uh, that program, but the, the, the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program is, is of vital importance. And, and we, as, as, a, as RCUSA, as a coalition, and as the other individual organizations and individuals represented on this call attest, we're all dedicated uh, to making that work and making it work better um, at all, at all uh, phases of the process of providing welcome for refugees. Um, I wanted to make one point of clarification when Dauda mentioned the 100 million. Um, he was also referring to not only refugees, but the internally displaced persons. I think the last UN numbers were somewhat below that, but they're likely to be higher uh, when they come out with um, the UNHCR's uh, estimates of the totally the total size of the displaced displaced population uh, for World Refugee Day this June, um, and uh, the size of the refugee subset there is is immense and growing. Um, I'm going to give one last opportunity. I don't see any open questions in the Q&A, but if anyone would like to raise anything uh, for our panelists, uh, please do so now. And uh, in the meantime, um, I would also invite any of our panelists, if they would like to add anything to what's already been said, uh, please uh, feel free to do so. Well, hearing none and seeing no questions, with that, I'd like to uh, conclude this webinar. And uh, once again, thank you to our participants, to those who joined us, and a recording will be available and we'll have uh, some remarks uh, to provide uh, to the media and via social media following the call. Thank you all very much.